Studies and the director of the MA Youngian and Post Youngian Studies at the University of Essex. Uh, originally from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Came here, yes, any Canadians in the room? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Canada. Yeah, Canada. I feel the love, I feel the love, yeah. <laughs> so originally from Toronto, uh, came here, com oh, sorry, I completed my first degree, uh, a BA, uh, honors BA at the University of Toronto, and then came here uh, for my MA in Psychology of Religion at Heathrow College, University of London, and then jumped ship to the University of Essex where I completed my PhD. Um, and lucky me, I ended up working there. I've been there for nearly eight years now. Um, now just to, to begin, anyone interested in, in Jung's theories? Anyone know who Jung is? C.G. Jung? Oh, okay, fantastic. <laughs> I was actually going to play just a, a little, you know, word association game. So if I ask you Jung, what's the, or say Jung, what's the first word that comes to your mind? Freud. Freud, usually. Right? Jung is, is basically seen as this renegade disciple of Freud, but obviously there's an argument that Jung is an independent thinker um, in his own right. And a lot of that work actually has been forwarded by Sonu Shambhasani from UCL, so part of the University of London. But Today, our concern is Jung's psychology of religion, both East and West. And there's a lot to, to cover here. So really, what I'm giving you today is just a, a snapshot, the briefest of snapshots. Um, and hopefully, I am actually going to get to, to the part on, on Eastern thinking as well. But what I want to do uh, is access some of his main ideas uh, on the psychology of religion through major texts. So this will include Answer to Job, um, and again, various texts that he wrote, or sorry, in, you know, various texts in which he wrote about uh, Eastern thought. Um, but I also want to take a, a, an academic approach, right? So we're not here just to kind of glorify Jung's ideas, we're here to critically assess them as well. So I'll list these, and perhaps we'll have more time to discuss this when we get to uh, the question period. So today we're looking at the importance of religion for Jung and analytical psychology, analytical psychology being the name that is given to Jung's psychology as distinct from psychoanalysis. So just very quickly, when I say depth psychology, depth psychology is an umbrella term that refers to all the talking therapies. This includes Freud, uh, Jung, and Adler, usually neglected. When we say psychoanalysis, we're referring specifically to Freud. When we say analytical psychology, we're referring specifically to Jung. And when anyone says individual psychology, which people really do these days, they're referring to Adler specifically. Um, right, so let's begin then. Let's look here. Jung's family background and early child experiences. So definitely don't want to reduce Jung's psychology of religion to his you know, upbringing, childhood, etc. Right, that would be psychobiography. But we can't deny the extent to which some of his thinking has been shaped by these early experiences. So Jung's father, Paul Achilles Jung, was a pastor, as were most males on his mother's side, and this included eight uncles. So to a certain extent, it was in the air, right? You could say it ran in the blood. Emily Pry's work, Jung's mother, was also known to possess clairvoyant abilities, which facilitates Jung's interest in the uncanny and his fascination with all aspects of that which may be considered spiritual. And this certainly influences his PhD thesis, right? His PhD thesis was on the psychology and pathology of occult phenomena. Um, and he was looking at the theme of dissociation in a mediumistic girl who happened to be, anyone knows? His cousin, right? Helene Fry's work. Uh, I don't think that would probably pass an ethics committee today. Um, but he was also inspired by the work of Theodore Fournois from India to the planet Mars specifically and French dissociate, uh, dissociationism more generally. Jung's father had lost his faith, right? This greatly affected and shaped Jung's impressions of, his, uh, of him and the nature of organized religion. And basically, he felt his father was a hypocrite, right? So he knew that his father lost his faith, and yet he proceeded and continued with his responsibilities. Now, you might say that Young's assessment of his father was quite harsh. They weren't a rich family, right? His father had to provide for the family. And it's usually the case the son's assessment of the father is quite critical. And we can only hope 
those of us who are fathers, that our sons aren't too harsh on us in the future. Now, looking back into to Young's childhood experiences, there's this very interesting example and vignette in Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Has anyone read Memories, Dreams, Reflections? Okay, fantastic. You're going to help me then. The vision of the turd. What happens with the vision of the turd? Just yell it out, somebody. Tell me the story. What happens in this vision? Go ahead, sir. Okay, fantastic. So basically, Young's in Basel. He's walking home one day. And he feels this urge, right? This thought coming to his mind. And he immediately stops, right? He says, I cannot think this through to its, to its logical conclusion. So he holds this, right, for about three days or so. And after about three days, he realizes that the thought actually needs to be expressed. He has to kind of think it through to its logical conclusion. And as our colleague has said, what basically happens, a large turd falls from the sky and smashes the roof of Basel Cathedral, right? And after that, he feels much, much better. I mean, in terms of Freud, you could see this as the anal face to a certain extent. But we have to, to be a bit careful about what Jung is doing here in MDR. I mean, first and foremost, Memories, Dreams, Reflections is usually sold um, and, and you know, presented to the public as Jung's autobiography. It is not his autobiography, right? It is actually Emilia Fay's biography. She was the one taking the notes, if you will. On top of it, there's just so much complexity that basically what's being presented was mediated by family members, right? I.e. people who didn't want the warts and all story of Young to actually be out there. And the main people who've written on this are obviously uh, Sonia Shambhasani from UCL and uh, Alan C. Elms. I think it's Alan. Yeah, Alan C. Elms. Um, but if you want, come to me afterwards. I can give you those references. But, you know, we're, so we're critical of how Young is remembering the event, how hindsight is always 2020, but his description of it certainly says something about his psychology of religion, right? And we can begin to, to draw a parallel or a link with how Young sees this vision and Paul Tillich's ideas um, encapsulated in his book, The Courage to Be. So the first idea, this notion of the God above God, right? So there's the God of the institution, Right? But the true experience of God, the true God, actually lies beyond the God that we worship at this particular level. Right? The second major theme that we can take away is that faith encompasses doubt. Right? Young's doubt is not heretical and comes closer to true faith when compared to the persona or facade that his father maintained. So blind faith is not the route to an experience of the divine. God actually wanted Young to think the blasphemous, uh, the blasphemous thought through to its logical conclusion, right? Now, going back to this notion of God above God, what Young is basically saying and what we see as a hallmark of the psychology of religion is that Western religion has lost its capacity to hold an experience of the numinous, right? Um, what Rudolf Otto terms the numinous, and we'll get back to that in a little bit. So these experiences sum up the ambivalence with which Jung regarded religion throughout his life. At one end, he realized his father's disenchantment was not unique. Religion can no longer hold the numinous for society. So for Jung, at the core of every major religion, every tradition, is an, an individual's experience with the numinous, right? So if you think of any founder of major religion at core, what they've experienced is a, a, an experience of the divine. Institutional religion then, how it grows in terms of the dogmas, the rituals, etc., are there to contain our engagement with the numinous. So we, we aren't necessarily able to approach that divine. However, with rituals, with dogma, we may be contained and approach that divine. Fantastic. Um, what Young is basically saying then that these, these dogmas, these rituals, um, institutional religion now cannot contain this experience of the numinous, right? And he points to very questionable acts within the Western tradition that have been done in the name of religion. So things like the Crusades, indulgences, etc. 
He wanted to emphasize the possibility of an experience of the numinous without the intervention of the middle name. Right? So he was really advocating this one-to-one -one connection with that which we consider divine, um, i.e. to restore a belief in the numinous other and to find a new container for this if need be. One critique of Jung actually is that he wanted to replace religion with his own psychology, i.e. rather than approaching the numinous through religion, you can now approach it through Jungian therapy. Right? So we'll discuss this critique uh, a bit later as well. But as we will see, Jung's faith in organized religion as a container for psychological transformation is restored in the latter parts of his life. At least this is the argument I will be presenting for you. Uh, sorry, to you. Um, very quickly, uh, the role of religion in Jung's break with Freud. This is part of the many theoretical differences that contributed to the split. In very general terms, Freud saw religion as neurotic, infantile, and a wish-fulfilling illusion. Jung saw religion as the task of the second half of life, something that's potentially rewarding, and the original container for personal development and self-knowledge. He also posits this notion of the religious function of the psyche, <laughs> i.e. that there is an inclination, something intrinsic within us that wants to pay homage to, to respect, to acknowledge, to experience that which is completely other than oneself, right? So if it's not God, it will become something else, right? So in many instances, money can become our God. For Freud, specifically, Jung would say that his theory of sexuality becomes his God, as well as um, his adherence to positivistic science. You can look at something else, something like alcoholism, the drink. Right, so drink, you can amplify, it's related to spirits, right, you drink spirits. Um, but for Jung, this really kind of points to the fact that any movement towards the drink is actually a cry out for meaning and an association with that which we uh, deem above oneself, right? So if we amplify this further, which is a, a classic Jungian technique, um, who is the god of the vine in Greek mythology? Dionysus, right? So what happens to Dionysus? His believers tear him apart during one of these rituals. And if Jung amplifies this further, then well, really we're talking about Christ as well, right? Christ is also the god of the vine, that who is actually dismembered and that entity which is actually reborn. But the interesting thing, if we're looking for a more concrete connection, one of the co-founders of AA, Bill Wilson, was actually in dialogue with Jung. It's not an extensive conversation, but certainly some of Jung's ideas played a part in uh, the construction of the 12-step program. <coughs> now, continuing on, uh, Jung's interest in comparative rel religion and his friendship with scholars and practitioners of religion. So Father Victor White, a Dominican priest and theologian, um, who wrote a very damning review of Answer to Job. We'll touch on this just very briefly. His friendship with Richard Wilhelm, the German sinologist and translator of the I Ching. Uh, Jung writes an intro to this and also an intro to The Secret of the Golden Flower. William James, uh, American scholar and psychologist, perhaps most famous for his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. And definitely after the break with Freud, he reached out to, to James and James was quite crucial uh, in containing that period for him. And if you look to the letters, Young is also in dialogue with many Jesuits as well. There's a religious tone to defining, uh, defining key concepts such as the collective unconscious, <coughs> the archetypes, uh, the archetypal self as being akin to the God image, his notion of individuation and synchronicity. But in the interest of time, let's just focus on individuation as a concept because it is quite crucial. What did Young mean by individuation? <coughs> Anyone know? Uh, separating from the collective. Yes, to a certain extent, but also returning to the collective as well. Yes. Anyone else? Or, so the, or is it the ambivalent? Yes, yes. <laughs> Anyone? The process of growth. Yes, process of growth. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Right. So say that again? Okay, right? So basically, Jung is saying that it's the process of becoming who we're born to be, 
right? That the best version ourselves, it's actually within us already. And our goal in life is actually to realize that potential within. And really, there comes a crucial point where we're called to this journey, right? The sanctification that we should be following this path. However, sometimes we don't want to follow that path because it's too difficult, at least on the surface. And basically, when we deny this call, right, we deny this call to fulfill who we truly are, Young said, well, shame on you, right? Because not only have you robbed yourself of your own true potential, you've also robbed your contribution to the world, the biggest contribution that you can make to the world. So with individuation, it's important to note that yes, there is a period of regression and withdrawal from society, but it also is there to cultivate the more collective aspects of oneself that ultimately we have to work within the framework of society. We have to return and contribute to the collective. And this is not an easy task, right? There are going to be periods of alienation, which are potentially very painful. There's going to be suffering. Um, individuation is certainly not for the faint of heart. And basically the link here is that as an example, right, uh, as an amplificatory uh, point, Young says the life of Christ is the quintessential example of the individuation process, right? We'll get back to that uh, a little later on. He also said that um, in the second half of life, all the people who were coming, him, uh, coming to him for therapy, there was not one person, right, not one therapeutic, uh, therapeutic instance when the concern was not something religious in nature, i.e. reconnecting the individual to the divine. Um, right, now, let's really begin with the key concepts in Answer to Job. Anyone had a chance to read Answer to Job, or even the Book of Job, anyone know the Book of Job? A few people. Okay, so maybe I'll go light on the story, focus more on the concepts. So Young's concept of the shadow, right? Let's do this. Just start shouting out to me what you hate in other people. What do you dislike most in other people? Deceit. Deceit, fantastic, what else? Arrogance. Arrogance. What else? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Ignorance. Greed. Ignorance. Narcissism. Narcissism. Anything else? Unkindness. Unkindness. One more. Sociopathy. Sociopath. Okay. <laughs> right. Fantastic. Young would basically say, take that all back. Right? Take that all back. Because what we've described here, what we hate in other people, actually lies in C4 within ourselves. It is something that we can acknowledge within ourselves, right? So this is the key idea with shadow, that we have a tendency to project it onto others. We can't tolerate that negativity within ourselves, so you know what? It doesn't belong to me, it belongs to that person over there, right? So this is a key concept that we actually have to keep in mind when we're looking uh, to, to Young's assessment, if you will, of different God images in Answer to Job and also in the New Testament. So very briefly, um, at the start of Answer to Job, you have the prologue in heaven, right? And basically there's a divine wager, right? So Satan, or personification of Satan, is actually there, and he challenges God, and he says, I bet you any money I can corrupt your most faithful servant. Right? And God says, no, you can't. And he's like, well, yes, I can. But the main issue is that the seed of doubt has already been planted in God's mind. And basically, God gives in, and he said, fine. There's Job, right? The faithful. Go and do your worst. Right? So basically, God is giving him full access, uh, you know, full, um, you know, allowing him, if you will, to play Job. Right? Now, Take pause here for a second. Young starts to notice a few interesting things. First and foremost, Satan is kind of not separate from the divine hierarchy, right? He's actually there conversing with God in dialogue. It's not as if he's been banished. Or not I'm saying he. It's not as if that energy, it, has been banished to, to some other place. So Young amplifies this a bit more. He says, well, if we look to the second creation story, Right, i.e. in Genesis, the serpent is there. Right? The serpent is part of that divine plan, a part of that original paradise. So if we go back to this notion of the shadow, what actually happens in Christianity is that evil aspect, that part that we can't own within ourselves, is actually projected onto a scapegoat. 
all right, actually the devil. And the devil bears the brunt of it. That energy holds those projections of negativity that we can't see within ourselves. And Young basically says that's not unfair. Because if you think symbolically, right, and you look at the symbolism tied to the devil, etc., there's actually something potentially transformative and positive, right? So what's another name for the devil? How else do we refer to the devil? Satan, devil? Lucifer. Okay, fantastic, Lucifer. Now, there's no one passage that encapsulates this is what happened with the fall of Lucifer. You know, there, there are two main passages, one from Isaiah, one from Ezekiel. But let's just go with it for a second. You know, this is the nature of Young's thinking, a bit problematic. Lucifer, what does it actually translate into? The bringer of light. The bringer of light, the morning star, right? So let's go with Young then. Let's amplify this a bit more. If we think of other parallels, let's say in mythology, who else brings a source of light? Who steals fire from the gods and brings it to the people? Prometheus. So there's a psychological link, if you will, between these different characters and the potential psychological function they actually play. So, we cannot bear to witness the evil within us, all right? So that evil is projected onto another finger, and a uh, figure, sorry, finger, that's a Freudian slip, and Jung sees this as a wider issue in the Western religious traditions. We need to maintain a persona of purity and goodness, right? And we eject all the negative qualities from us uh, onto someone else. Now, there's this very interesting vignette. Jung basically hears about this priest, Right, really famous priest, known for his piety. So Young goes and visits him, follows him around for about three days, and thinking, you know what, I'm gonna find something about this guy, right? That's just a, a bit dark. But after about three days, he realizes, man, this guy is actually perfect. And I actually have to go back and rethink my own morality, my own ethics, my own position. That is until he speaks to his wife. Right? And he realizes that all the darker aspects of his personality get projected onto her and their relationship. So it's that strained relationship where all that shadow is held. She has to hold all the negative aspects of him so that he can maintain that perfect face or persona uh, to the other world. So if we expand this a bit, Christianity casts out the intrinsic evil within uh, within itself or within the tradition onto the figure of the devil. We need to be all good. We need to avoid being bad. If we are bad, we are tempted by the devil. And you can see here this idea of the ritual scapegoat. Yet Young would argue the scapegoat was also the catalyst for transformation. Casting that scapegoat out in the Greek tradition and in Jewish tradition as well meant renewal for the community. And I'd just like to point out how interesting it is that in Christianity, we both demonize and worship the scapegoat because arguably Christ is also a scapegoat. For Jung, the split between good and evil is a fantasy. We need to withdraw those projections, i.e. to not eject all the negativity onto others and to acknowledge the evil within ourselves, to not project this onto another figure, a neighbor, a race, a country, etc and many Jungian interventions into interpreting collective phenomena have used the concept of the shadow um, to frame, if you will, larger conflicts um, at the societal level. Sorry about that. Only in this way can a more realistic and fulfilling relationship with the other be achieved. And, if you will, the devil is not all bad. It is that imperative which may seem to do evil, but may actually end up doing good. Now, I always cringe when I ask this to my undergraduates because no one puts up their hand. But um, anyone read uh, Faust, part one? Okay, not bad, it's a relief. So he, he makes a connection, right? He amplifies again um, with the figure of Mephisto, right? Mephistopheles in Faust. And basically, Faust is this scholar. He's this introvert, uh, introverted scholar who is only concerned with book learning. Right? But that means he's actually one-sided because he doesn't necessarily know what it means to experience life. Mephisto is that energy, that catalyst that perhaps seems to be negative but actually pushes him out of his bookly concerns, if you will, and actually into life itself. 
right? Now, obviously, this way of thinking is not unproblematic. Jung is basically positing the reality and existence of evil. This is a source of conflict and ultimately the major stumbling block um, in his relationship and dialogue with Father Victor White. And this surrounds uh, the, uh, the concept, if you will, of privatio bani, the privation of good. And basically this posits that you know, evil, evil itself has no existence, right? Even the most evil thing in the world still has a semblance of good. The light is never ever diminished, uh, if you will, right? So the good cannot be banished and maintains it, its existence even in the most difficult circumstances. And Young said, well, actually, that's not true, right? Their evil is exists. We can kind of discuss this a bit more. But basically, people charge Young with being a Manichaean, a dualist, um, and also a Gnostic. Now, moving on, the nature of God. Have I missed a few slides here? I don't know. Here we go. The nature of God. Young goes on to describe God of the Old Testament, right? As portrayed in Answer to Job. And the God of the Old Testament here is a jealous God, right? Young would say he is an unreflecting God. Satan throws out a challenge that he would be able to sway even God's most stalwart and faithful servant, Job. God is persuaded to allow Satan to do his worst, visiting upon Job affliction after affliction. God cannot deal with the idea of betrayal. Yet if he referred to his own omniscience, he would see that Job is and will remain faithful. However, God does not allow that, or sorry, God does not do that and allows Satan to put Job to the test. He kills his family, takes away his land, plagues him with diseases, sores, boils, etc. Others come to counsel Job, right, telling him that he must have done something wrong, that God would not punish him um, otherwise, and therefore he should repent and ask for God's forgiveness. But Job stands firm and maintains his innocence. He demands an audience with God. In the end, he still bows and admits to God's greatness. And in the process, the comforters are punished and Job is rewarded. He gets new sons, even better ones than the last ones, even more land and riches, etc. So it really works out for him. Now, that's a very simplistic summary of the, of, of the narrative itself. But what does Young make of this? Young stresses Job's morality and his symbolic significance as a representation of consciousness. Job, a mere human, is more conscious than God. We begin to see some of the more blasphemous aspects of Young's thinking here. He shows God what God is lacking, i.e. the capacity for self-reflection. In many ways, Job is holding up a mirror to God and showing God what God is lacking. That God, too, is one-sided. In essence, Job is exposing God's shadow side, something that, within Jung's psychology, must be acknowledged and integrated if psychological growth and maturity are to be achieved. And this is what I would refer to as Jung's radical humanist stance, that humanity, i.e. represented by Job, is an equal to God and plays a crucial role in God's individuation. In many ways, it is because of Job's morality that he holds a higher position than God. Because, in terms of young psychology, it is only with consciousness and self-reflection that God can begin to see his shadow at work, i.e. the wager in heaven, and the extent to which God's shadow is projected onto Job. And again, we get the theme of the scapegoat here, right? Job becomes the scapegoat for God's projections. A mortal man is thus helping God along his own path and process of individuation. The God of the Old Testament is in a wholly unconscious state, and for young, individuation entails higher levels of consciousness, i.e. bringing that which is unconscious into consciousness. Right, So that a strong enough container or ego is actually built. Now, thinking this through a little bit, right? so we have God that's wholly unconscious in the Old Testament, we have this crucial role of a representation of humanity, i.e. Job. What do you think is the next logical step for Young then? How, how does God, if we can put God on the couch, because that's a big if, um, how does God continue this process of individuation? 
Yeah. Hmm? I think I heard that. Can someone say it again? No? Anyone else? <laughs> By becoming human. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> oh, fantastic. God's bringing us to Christ. Well done. Perceptive. Can't get, can't pass you, get, yeah, can't get one past you guys. Um, to become human, right? To become reincarnated as Christ, right? So if we look at the figure of Christ, half divine, half human, right? God needs to learn about self-reflection and consciousness. Now, God must become more conscious to experience what Job has experienced. God incarnating as Christ is the only way God can become morally on par with humanity. We can see now why Answer to Job was on the Vatican list of banned books when it was actually published, alongside another vision of Christ that was, you know, pretty much along the same lines. Does anyone know what that is? I know I didn't put that on here. <laughs> Nico's Cousin's Office, The Last Temptation, which was then made into a, a movie by Martin, uh, Martin Scorsese, Harvey Keitel as Judas, very interesting film. Um, Jesus' life is the psychological drama of individuation. Jesus' physical suffering is God's suffering, both literally and metaphorically. So if we look to Jesus' life, what is it defined by? Sacrifice, pain, we talked about the notion of the scapegoat. It encapsulates all that individuation entails. Jesus' death and resurrection are also God's death and resurrection. Jesus' humiliation is God's humiliation. Equally, Jesus' triumph and redemption are also God's triumph and redemption. What all this points to for Jung is a, de a greater degree of consciousness. Jung takes this one step further, right? The process is incomplete. If God of the Old Testament is one-sided, i.e. undifferentiated, vengeful, etc., then God of the New Testament is equally one-sided, right? And how is the God of the New Testament equally one-sided? I mean, he's thinking particularly, I think, or is being influenced by John, right? John forwards a very positive view of, you know, uh, of, of God, basically. And that is that there's this perfect image of God, that he can actually do no wrong. And consequently, what we have then is this ideal, right? This ideal that personifies perfection rather than wholeness. And for Jung, the, the real goal of the individuation process is not perfection, but wholeness. And wholeness actually entails being in touch with our shadow side, right? Knowing that we actually can't be perfect, that there's always going to be a darker aspect to ourselves that we need to integrate, that we actually need to be in dialogue with. Right. So, let's see where we are here. So, God of the New Testament, i.e. Testament, the personification as Christ, does not fully realize the shadow side. Psychologically speaking, this is very dangerous when we live in extremes, not holding the tension of opposites. So basically, what Young is seeing is this kind of huge oscillation between an image of, of God in the Old Testament and then the New Testament. And this relates to his idea of the self-regulating psyche. Basically, Jung posits that our psyches, right, in essence, want to be in balance because it's only within this middle position that creativity actually can, can come forth. And we can describe that a bit more in detail later on. But when we tend to move to one side, right, when we tend to hold to one position, we are actually in danger of flipping to the complete opposite. So I can give you an example. So let's say my facade to the world, my persona, is, is that of just the essence of machismo, right? I know I'm doing that right now, right? That I'm just ready to go. Anyone look at me the wrong way, let's go outside, man, right? Now, what Jung is saying is that that one-sidedness, right? That persona, that face we put to the world, it is actually compensated in the unconscious by something perhaps very fragile, right? Something that's been damaged. Right? We present that one-sided persona to protect that fragile essence that we cannot allow to be re-traumatized. Right? So for Jung, the real essence of, of integrating and becoming who we are is to sit in balance, right? to not sway to just simply, I want to be this way, 
I want to be that way. Because if we do that, there is the danger of what he calls an enantiodromia. I would write the right way, but it's, it's behind here. Right, this idea of a complete flip to its opposite. So I'll give you an example that stems from my youth. Um, it probably shows how old I am. Um, do you remember the band Corn? Anyone remember the band Corn? Okay, they drove a tank down the streets of Toronto. I was there. It was fantastic. Um, but one of the guitarists, right? I mean, if anyone knows anything about Corn, it's drugs and rock and roll. Rock and roll, right? It is the essence of the rock and roll lifestyle. Fantastic. Okay, but there was really an indulgence with the drugs, um, with alcohol, etc. But one guitarist actually converts and finds God, right? Just like that, quits the band. God. And at least, you know, we can't speak to the psychology of this particular guitarist, but at the same time, the actual flip itself with no mediation from one extreme to the other means that some kind of transition was almost too quick to a certain extent, right? That there, there hasn't been some kind of processing of what we're actually trying to find by flipping to the complete opposite. So, if we move back to the, the, the life of Christ as personified in the, the New Testament, what Jung is saying is that this flip has occurred in Christianity's conception of the Godhead, right? So in the New Testament, Jesus' temper is actually played down. His own struggles, his own fear, and humanity, which together, arguably, provide a more realistic image to which we may direct our worship. We are taught to worship and attain an unrealistic ideal. And that has, in part, impacted on the development of the Western psyche. And basically, what Young is saying here is that, you know, anyone who is born within the Christian tradition, we are asked to follow in the path of Christ, to imitate Christ, right? But really, what Young is saying is that, that that's just an unattainable idea, right? Our goal should not be to imitate Christ, to imitate Christ, but to dream the myth onward. And I'll say a bit more about that in a few seconds. So if we go back to the life of Christ, we do not see these other manifestations of his personality, his denial of his family upon his return from Nazareth, his turning over of the tables of the money changers of the temple. And we know this happens, right, in this particular instance. We see it in Josephus, but any of you who uh, study psychology from an act academic point of view or theology, um, this is in the same Gospels Q, um, which basically means that there's an agreement between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John, for all intents and purposes, is actually left out, right? So essentially, Jesus' Jesus's human aspects are denied. We focus on the divine, we fail to see the human. His anguished prayer in Gethsemane, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. So, how do we proceed from here? How do we address the one-sidedness of God in the New Testament? I'm not going to hit the slide yet. <laughs> Anyone have any idea? I think the blasphemous thought through to its logical conclusion. Us. Right? It is now up to us. It is now up to the rest of humanity to continue the work of greater consciousness. And again, for me, this points to Jung's radical humanist position. So Jung used the examples of Pentecost. God descends on his disciples in the form of fiery tongues. It is up to us now to do the work, to continue God's individuation. Why? If we are made in the image of God and God incarnates within us, then our fullest, reali uh, re our fullest realization also leads to God's realization and individuation. And this relates to Jung's idea of dreaming the myth onward, right? So it's not imitation, but fully living the values that Christ embodied in our own unique ways. Imitation can only take us so far. We must carve out our own path. What the story of Christ evidences is one way of achieving that goal. We need to find our own way to express this. The limitation of organized religion is basically this. It does not allow us to creatively live and experience the divine within. If anything, um, we develop what Ford would call a very harsh superego because we cannot obtain or, or sorry, attain that unrealizable ideal. Now, let's take pause for a second here. <laughs> 
there's a very dangerous implication to Young's thinking here, i.e. conceiving of the God of the Old Testament as archaic, unconscious, unreflective, etc., and the God of the New, uh, New Testament as perhaps more developed, right? Again, one side as well, but definitely more developed from God of the Old Testament. So what's the implication here? Might have to weave in some of Young's history that we know of as well. He bridges into Semitism. Absolutely, right? God of the Old Testament, right? Uh, the Yahweh, um, the God that is the object of worship for Judaism, is less developed than the God of the New Testament, i.e., Western Christendom. Now, some of you might say, well, you know, maybe it's just his developmental theories, etc. But uh, as Luke pointed out, if you look to the accusations against Young, right, of anti-Semitism during that period, very robust, actually, um, arguments and, and concerns, then you can see this in the different light, right? There's a very slippery slope here in terms of how Young is thinking here. Obviously, that's another lecture in and of itself. But if you want, if you go to Q, right, the archives in Q, you will find a dossier that was collected, or sorry, that was compiled, basically urging that Young be tried for war crimes, right? Now, this obviously didn't come to fruition. There's obviously multiple ways to approach this debate and to access this, but certainly it, it's the shadow side of analytical psychology that we all have to acknowledge and deal with if we're going into this discipline. Now, moving on, Sophia, wisdom. So if you read the book of Job, there's this real interesting interlude, right? It almost seems like it comes out of nowhere, that the narrative is going one way, and then all of a sudden, bam, Sophia, right? So Young is trying to understand this very interesting pause, if you will, in the narrative itself. Um, so Sophia is the personification of wisdom. How does Young interpret this? Now, we have to say this is definitely some questionable theology, right? Young is basically providing symbolic interpretations that assume a certain continuity. But doing this does not necessarily pay heed to the historical and contextual work that is required. I'm not a theologian, but I've worked with theologians, and trust me, they're really interested in the nitty gritty. So basically, you know, this psychological theorizing, while very interesting perhaps, and you know, potentially seductive as well, doesn't actually do justice to what other people are doing in other disciplines, right? And Young is not necessarily understanding these texts um, integrally, right? So just keep that in the back of your mind. But this is his interpretation. Wisdom is needed for self-reflection, which God lacks. Young determines that God has forgotten wisdom, personified by the female figure of Sophia, who was also present when all was created. Her memory, role, and importance need to be revived. For Young, Western religion is missing the feminine aspect and what this feminine symbolizes. If Western religion is to thrive, to be able to contain once more the religious needs and experiences of Western civilization, it needs to integrate this aspect. Does this happen? For Young, there are certainly signs of hope. And I've put it there, so I won't ask you anyways, right? He really is um, reinvigorated by the Assumption of Mary. So 1950, the Assumption of Mary is a, pap a papal bull that declares Mary, mother of God, was brought up into heaven after her bodily death, right? So after her death, body and soul, she was lifted up to heaven. This for Young symbolizes her equivalence and godlike status in relation to the Trinity, i.e. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For Young, the Trinity cannot express completion as it stands, or as it stands, um, oh sorry, for Young, the Trinity cannot express completion and as it stands, resonates in overtly masculine energy and emphasis. So you could argue that, you know, well, the Holy Spirit is more of a neutral energy anyways. But if you look at, you know, Father and Son, there's definitely something very masculine there. What Mary's assumption facilitates is an acknowledgement of the feminine and all this entails symbolically. Embodiment, relationality, etc., etc. And for Young, four, the number four, not three, resonates completion. Now, why is that? Again, this is problematic, 
how Yang is working, because you could say, well, I can look to mythology, all the different cultures of the world, and seven is actually really you know, a crucial number. But going with this, why is four important for Yang and not three? What comes in fours, the best things coming in fours? Anyone? Even number? Yes. So if you want to give me some examples of what comes in four. <coughs> What's that? Fantastic. That's, you're, you're on the right track. Four cardinal points, right? Four seasons, four elements, four evangelists, so on and so forth, right? So this is the type of thinking, the type of approach, methodological approach that Young is using. So finding the fourth is finding completion. We inch closer to a religious framework that may tolerate, maintain, and contain a journey towards wholeness. But this in itself is not without limitations. Again, we're only dealing with one aspect of the feminine, i.e. Mary as mother. There are also other personifications of the feminine, and to only emphasize one is to limit the range of ways in which femininity may be expressed. So we have the dark Madonna, we have Kali, the vengeful, Aphrodite, the sexual and seductive. Nonetheless, Jung interpreted the assumption of Mary to be an occasion of significant psychological importance. It evidenced the possibility that organized religion in Western society may begin to hold more. To re-enchant a, so a, so uh, a society that had become disenchanted with and because of religion. In terms of his psychology, it was a recognition of the archetypal anima. I won't get too much into the anima, but just the, the kind of crux of what I want to say here, I argue that this is a real turning point in Jung's ambivalent stance towards organized religion. Uh, sorry, that was a picture of the Assumption of Mary. Uh, we've talked about that. Okay, by 1957, uh, in his text, The Undiscovered Self, Jung sees religion as one way in which individuals may defend against mass-mindedness, i.e. this notion of group psychology, um, you know, the mass doesn't think, right? The individual gets lost in the mass. And in this sense, he's not different from Le Bon and Freud. So with no religious framework that will sufficiently contain an experience of the numinous, a godlike status is attributed to the state, and the state serves as an outlet for the religious function of the psyche. But in the state, the individual loses his or her individuality. The state is ruled by generali uh, generalities and averages, which in turn facilitates mass-mindedness. <coughs> so there's a blind following. People are always caught in a frenzy without the power of self-reflection. Only the individuated for Young can stand against this mass, and he writes. And basically, the, the way we cite Young is collected works volume 10, and that points to the paragraph. So that's paragraph 540. Resistance to the mass can be affected only by the man or woman who is well organized in his or her individuality as the mass itself. The real shift is that for Jung, this individuality may be facilitated within organized religion. However, my reading of this is debatable, but I'd like you to, to point uh, you to the, the evidence in the, the text that I believe you know, is showing Jung leaving more room uh, for the expansion, if you will, of Christianity. So for Jung, religion opposes stately authority with the authority of a higher power. Just as man, as a social being, cannot in the long run exist without a tie to the community, so the individual will never find the real justification for his existence and his own spiritual and moral autonomy anywhere except in an extra mundane principle capable of relativizing the overpowering influence of external factors. The individual who is not anchored in God can offer no resistance on his own resources to the physical and more blandishments of the world. And he continues, his, i.e. the individual's, individual relation to God would be an effective shield against these pernicious influences, end quote. Arguably, there is some tension and ambiguity here. One could suggest that Jung is emphasizing a one-to-one -one experience with God, i.e. not the God of organized religion, right? that he's really talking about the God within. But in light of his theorizing in answer to Job and his renewed faith in Christianity's psychological advancement, 
One may argue that there is an openness in Young that allows for a profound hope that organized religion can play the role of a potent faith standing against mass mindedness. And for me, this is the quintessential <coughs> quotation. That is not to say that Christianity is finished. I am, on the contrary, convinced that it is not Christianity, but our conception and interpretation of it that has become antiquated in face of the present world situation. The Christian symbol is a living thing that carries itself, that carries in itself the seeds of further development. It can go on developing. It depends only on us whether we can make up our minds to meditate again and more thoroughly on the Christian premises." End quote. This faith in religion is only confined to Western religion, particularly Christianity and the state of the Western psyche. A Westerner, for example, turning to the East for this framework will not find containment but the threat of contagion and being overwhelmed by the unconscious, but we will get to that. So, very quickly, let's just list some of the critiques. We can, again, discuss these uh, at the end if you want. So, critiques against Jung's psychology of religion. Jung basically treats God like an individual patient. Right? God is not a human being and can't be proverbially uh, put on the couch. Number two, Jung supposes he has a hotline to God. And this is not me. There's a critique against him which basically is that Jung feels he's got a hotline to God. Three, Jung attempts to replace one religious framework with another, i.e. therapy. And this is really you know, well argued, although this book is problematic itself. In Richard Knoll's uh, text, The Jung Cult, is basically saying that Jung set up a cult in Switzerland. I people had to come to him, and it was the basis for a new religion and initiation. The Jewish philosopher uh, Martin Buber, probably best known for his philosophy of dialogue, really encapsulated the main concerns and critiques with Jung's approach to the psychology of religion. First and foremost, Jung psychologizes religion. Right? This is a one-way conversation. Jung is interpreting religion in light of his own concepts and not seeing the phenomena on its own terms. Right? So in terms of Buber's philosophy, this is a monologue rather than true dialogue. Um, Jung also reduces the experience of God, i.e. the I, or sorry, reduces the experience of God. And basically Buber had this, uh, this notion of the I-it versus the I-thou relationship. Does anyone know about I-it and I-thou? Yes? Yeah, fantastic. So there, there's a real, you know, in the I thou relationship, which is the, the essence or ex the, the true expression of dialogue, there it, it is kind of humility, right? And this kind of equal footing with which we approach that conversation. What, what Buber is suggesting by saying young psychology is only working at the I it level is that he's not, he's not approaching religion on an equal footing. Right? He's kind of, he's got this conquistador approach, this very colonizer's model, where he wants to only use religion to show the efficacy and the truth, if you will, of his psychological ideas. So he's not meaning the other as other. And basically, there's a very interesting back and forth. Um, and Jung replies, I mean, it wasn't the, the most robust and convincing uh, reply from Jung's part, but he gets quite angry. And he basically says uh, to, to Buber, how dare you tell me that I have no idea of the numinous, right? That I'm only working at the level of the I, it, rather than the I, thou. And he goes on to invite Buber to come with him into a mental asylum, right? So perhaps some of you know, when Jung started his training, he was working with schizophrenics at perhaps the most prestigious hospital in the world at that time, the, the Bukowski mental, uh, mental Hospital. And he basically allow, uh, so invites uh, Buber to come to a mental asylum and say, I will show you my patients, right? You come walk with me, and then you tell me whether or not I have an inkling of what the numinous means, right? Whether or not I'm truly talking about I, it, or I, thou. It is clear from Jung's interpretation of Christianity that he took an unorthodox approach to interpreting the psychology of religion, 
one based arguably on finding parallels and evidence of his own psychological contentions. This at times conquistador approach to applied psychoanalysis is equally apparent in his interpretation of the psychology of Eastern religions. Regardless of his potential good intentions and his attempt to build bridges with the East, there are implications to the theoretical violence that may stem from the application of a psychology that is historically situated in the West, one that may not see the East on its own terms, one that promotes a monologue rather than a true dialogue. And it is to Young's engagement with the East that we now turn. So everyone, just take a few seconds. We'll close that. And we're back to this. Not much of a break. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, let's see. Oh, whoop. here we go. There's more of a break. And then, OK. From the outset, it is very important to note that Young's views on the East are not really about the East. Right? Young's views on the East are not about the East. If anything, it tells us something about the West and Western thinking. It is, in psychoanalytic terms, Young's fantasy of the East filtered through the lens of his psychology. That is not to say that fruitful ideas do not stem from Young's engagement. They did. But as with Young's interpretation of Christianity, we need to be mindful of an approach that prioritizes the strengthening of a set of ideas one that was constantly searching for greater legitimacy and recognition in the medical sciences. J.J. Clark and Harold Coward, um, two separate scholars, um, both wrote books called Young and Eastern Thought. Right? One British was at Kingston University, uh, one Canadian, uh, uh, Canadian at Calgary. Um, and they both argued convincingly that Young's concepts such as the self, individuation, archetypes, the collective unconscious, and active imagination were shaped by texts and ideas from the ancient traditions of China and India. Young uses the East as cultural evidence in conjunction with his method of amplification to formulate a cultural psychology that transcended his clinical material. For example, central to Young's psychology um, are the concepts of the collective unconscious and the archetypes. And these ideas certainly forward the perspective of collectivity and universality. If we can find parallels in the materials of the East that point to the same themes as those covered in the West, that Eastern forms of these themes crop up in the dreams and fantasies of Westerners, we have provided, at least according to Young, potentially compelling evidence and an argument that his conception of the psyche was correct, that it can transcend cultural boundaries and we actually share more in common than we actually believe. There are other similarities between Young's way of working and Eastern thought. The East's capacity for introspection and the grasp of the need for inner transformation and self-realization seemed remarkably similar to Young's own therapeutic endeavors. In essence, he is, once again, mining the cultural products of the world to find proof to validate his psychological approach and clinical methods. He also wanted to highlight that the West had neglect, neglected to explore and take seriously the inner life and psychological reality. Engaging in Eastern thought acts as a corrective to this lack. And I think here we can see Young's notion of compensation working. Turning to the East compensates and brings back into balance the West's neglect of the East. It emphasizes the marginalization of Eastern thought in the West and brings into question the perceived superiority of the West. Young's emphasis on learning about cultures other than his own is also a statement about how therapists need to move beyond the individual in order to help their patients. So this is you know, really reflective of why Young actually went into mythology in the first instance. Right? It's not just that he was fascinated by mythology. And we're really going back to his time at the Brugotsky here. And basically, you know, he's working with schizophrenic patients, right? He, he was actually living, um, you know, in the, uh, the asylum itself and interacting with uh, these patients on a day-to-day, -day, you know, day-to-day -day basis several times a day in some instances. And basically what he's realizing in these fantasies that they're telling him was a lot of mythological material, right? And what he determined, which was you know, revolutionary back then, is that there is actually some logic here. These, not, these people are not insane, right? We shouldn't just kind of banish them 
into to one place, lock the door, and throw away the key. So, you know, the reason why he started studying mythology is like, okay, these patients are bringing this mythological material. I need to understand this. The fault is not with them. It's my fault, right? The onus now is on me to try to access the material, to find the logic that other people cannot see, right? To walk in their shoes. And basically, he begins to compile, and you know, this really takes him away from his work with Freud. Uh, it just goes away and just reads you know, about mythology. And his whole premise is that if we find the legend of the key, right, we begin to find or potentially access the logic of these schizophrenic patients. Right? So in essence, it, it was quite revolutionary at the time that he was really putting the emphasis back on, on the patients and not seeing them as completely other, i.e. the other soci society, the shadow of society, we shouldn't be dealing with them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right, so in the same vein, Eastern images, etc., this material crops up in the fantasies and the dreams of Western patients. Right? So in order for the therapist to help his or her patients, they need to transcend these cultural uh, boundaries. It demands our understanding, and to do so, the therapist needs to consider the wider social and global context of thoughts and images. Jung's interest in the East began as early as 1909 and lasted until the last months of his life when he was studying Buddhism in greater detail. Arguably, however, this interest was sparked as early as his childhood when he recalled being captivated by Hindu myths. We also know that Jung practiced yoga and meditation during his own confrontation with the unconscious. So really, the, the Red Book period, if anyone is familiar with that. Excuse me. There are also some brief references to Oriental ideas in his student lectures, the Zavingya lectures. Uh, the Zavingya Society was his fraternity. And there are also indications of his engagement with Eastern ideas in his first quote-unquote Jungian books, i.e. when he's beginning to carve his own identity. So the earlier forms, if you will, of what is now known as symbols of transformation, as well as his book on psychological types. And here he's emphasizing the ideas of duality, the complementarity, or sorry, the complementary nature of opposites, the need of finding a middle path to mediate the opposites. So again, pointing to this notion of the self-regulating psyche, we're seeing how both uh, Buddhist and Taoist ideas are finding their way into Jung's psychology. Now, mandalas, right? Jung uses a lot of mandalas. He draws mandalas, uh, mandalas. He actually begins drawing them and doesn't realize that he's drawing mandalas until he meets Richard Wilhelm, right? Who points him to these texts and then he goes, aha, right? It, it, it's a mandala that I'm actually drawing, right? So usually with the mandala, you'll have this idea, right, of a circle and usually four cardinal points, i.e. this number of four as completion or some variation uh, of four within the larger circle. And Jung begins to notice them arising not only in his own dreams, but in the dreams of his patients, right? And he really begins to, you know, to, to cultivate this as a part of the, uh, therapeutic practice, i.e. he was encouraging his patients to go away and to draw, right? To create these mandalas, to create their own versions of the Red Book. Now, what, Jung, what is really interesting in Jung is that he begins to see that the mandala is a theme that kind of transcends all cultures. And if the individual psyche has a soul, a city, a geographical space also has a soul. And that mandala is really pointing to a similar thing, i.e. this notion of the self, right? This potential for wholeness and completion. So if you look at many cities, right, especially the older cities, you will find that the center, right, the soul of the city itself is usually constructed as a space for collectivity, but also in many instances is constructed as a mandala. There's also the concept of yin and yang, i.e. of opposites, um, but for him it's also a representation of his theory of contrasexual opposites, i.e. the anima and animus respectively. Right, now getting into the crux of it. Jung believed that an engagement with Eastern thought must begin from a Western perspective i.e. the importance of maintaining the strong enough ego or container. As the East is, according to Jung, by nature closer to the unconscious, its access to it is very different from the West's. 
It is possible, therefore, that the Western psyche may become overwhelmed if engaging with the East from a symbol set and system that is not of their own making, one that is not entrenched in the traditions of a specific geographical space. So for Jung, the container essentially is not fit for purpose. The West must engage the unconscious on its own terms and not adopting wholesale an approach that is opposed to its own. There are obviously implications to this way of thinking. And for me, you know, when I encounter this in Jung, I think back to my days as a history student, and it begs the question of whether the East can exist on its own terms, i.e., can there be a history of the East without the West, without Western encroachment? Is the East only noteworthy on a world stage once the West has entered, uh, has entered the picture? So, returning to Jung's position, there is a wisdom to be gained from the East, i.e., it is more aware of the inner life. But equally, the East reaches an awareness of the unconscious through potentially dangerous means and spiritual practices. And this is according to Jung. If the West is one-sided, i.e. extroverted and overtly rational, the East is equally one-sided, i.e. it lacks a firm grounding in the realities of the here and now. It seeks to escape um, from reality rather than dealing with it. The West, through psychology and other disciplines such as science and history, may reach a more related and meaningful contact with the unconscious, one mediated by, uh, by and firmly planted in an embodied existence that does not deny the physicality of life. If we wish to heal the problems of the Western world, to speak to its disenchanted state by re-enchanting existence through an engagement with the unconscious and its connection to the numinous, then turning to the East does not get to the root of the problem. In fact, it could cause greater disequilibrium. For instance, and this is Jung's interpretation, yoga's aim is to become one with the unconscious, to obliterate consciousness altogether and to unite with the ultimate reality. Read psychologically, it amounts to either over-identification or psychosis i.e. because the strong ego or container is lacking, one is over-identifying uh, with the contents of the unconscious rather than being in relationship with them. So essentially, Jung had to maintain and firmly you know, planted in his Western perspective. He could not accept the loss of an ego. If higher selfhood were attained, we still need an ego or consciousness to process that such a state has been achieved. No ego means no awareness of the state of being has been reached. This seems peculiar, right? In light of the actions of the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, once nirvana is achieved, he chose not to become sattva, but decided to return to earthly existence so that he may teach others. Not only does this note a crucial stage in the hero's journey, i.e. the theme of withdrawal and return, it evidences a return to consciousness i.e. an appreciation for the phenomenal world and an understanding that nirvana can only be reached in our incarnation as humans. Jung ultimately rejects any fully realized state of illumination, for he states that individuation cannot be achieved in one's lifetime. Only in death can a semblance of individuation be achieved. Ultimately for Jung, life is about tension, right, and dialectical opposition. It is only intention that create that sorry, it is only intention that creativity and new possibilities are achieved. And this relates to his idea of the transcendent function. So basically what he's saying here is that you know when people are growing, when they're developing, there comes a point where crucial decisions need to be made. Right? And again, Young is against rushing in to one one way of doing things, right? This is the way to do it. Boom. Um, he's actually advocating sitting in the middle, right, of not being tempted to just jump from one position or the other. Because if we do that, the danger is this potential flip, this idea of enantiodromia. So the tension of opposites literally means being torn between the opposites, right, of not necessarily jumping to this or that conclusion, but allowing for a new possibility to arise. And this new possibility could be entirely something entirely new, i.e. not of this position or that, or it could be a combination of those two positions as well. So just give you a you know, very, uh, well, 
hopefully a real life example. Um, several job opportunities arise, right, for you, right? One entails staying here in the UK. One entails, oh, I don't know, going to California, right? It's bright and sunny there right now. What Young is saying is that, right, you have these two positions, right? You have these two options in front of you. What you really want to do is not just to jump in and say, no, it's either this or that. If you actually wait, right, and really sit with the, the tension that this causes of not knowing where you're going, something new might actually arise. Perhaps a third possibility, right, that is either not any one of these, but, it, you know, again, it could be any combination of the two. Maybe you'll be allowed to work in California for part of the time and still have roots in the UK. Who knows, right? But psychologically, the real aim is, again, not to jump to either one-sided position. Now, if we return to Jung's um, psychology of Western religions, you can see why, for him, the cross is actually the quintessential example of this idea of transcendent function. Because Christ being crucified on the, uh, on the cross is that image of suffering and tension, what it means to be uh, pulled in different directions. And in the case of Christ, it's being half human and half divine, right? And what actually gives birth is you know, this possibility of being re reborn as something different. So going back to Jung's ideas on Eastern thought, complete liberation from suffering can only mean death or psychosis. So as it becomes clear, Jung was against Westerners imitating Eastern practices. And as mentioned earlier, he championed the individual authenticity when engaging archetypal imperatives and narratives to, proverb to proverbially dream the myth onwards. In this way, Jung is displaying a strong sense of the cultural and historical embeddedness of religious and philosophical beliefs. Mainly, our contexts have shaped our egos in very particular ways. And this emphasis um, finds expression in his distinction between an archetype and an archetypal image. I won't jump into that now, but we can certainly uh, discuss that uh, during the question period, uh, period. This is the point. Engaging with the practices of another culture leads to superficial imitation. We cannot fully integrate and understand another culture. We will always be alienated. We will always be the outsiders. But what Jung is arguing against is what we might call today a consumerist attitude to cultural products, i.e. seeing culture as a commodity. Religious beliefs are now encapsulated in fads, fashions, jewelry, etc. But this doesn't necessarily speak to the true emotion and feeling at the heart of an experience of the numinous. We pick and choose like we're in a candy store, right? We take a bit of that, a bit of this, rather than staying close to and working with the images that our own culture has created and inherited. It betrays an attitude of not wanting to stick to things, not wanting to work things through, a throwaway culture defined by consumption. So. There's a hole in my trousers. Just the very smallest nick in, you know, in my jeans right here. What I do, I'll run out and grow a new pair. Well, you know, back in the day, no one would actually do that. You would mend it, right? But you know, although there is something um, commendable in Young's ideas here and what he's forwarding, we have to appreciate or take into consideration that he's coming from the position of privilege. So yes, he grew up poor, but he actually married into the second wealthiest family in Switzerland at the time, right? So he's not coming from a position of lack at all, right? He has the choice to make those decisions, i.e. to mend his trousers or not. So we cannot abandon our Western heritage. It is within the framework of Western religions that we must work. We can further understand then the hope Young felt with the assumption of Mary and the subsequent hope that he expressed in the undiscovered self, i.e. the possibility that Western Christendom can begin to shift and to change once again to contain the development of the inner life of Westerners. Now, uh, sorry, missed that slide. Critiques against Young's approach to the East. Clearly, it's potentially Eurocentric, right? In Young's defense, we could argue um, that Young is reflecting his own time and context, but within our own context, his approach seems restrictive. He could not foresee the nature of our globalized world and diaspora communities and the benefits that these develop 
developments may bring. In that sense, Jung could be exaggerating the extent to which we are rooted in our own culture, especially in light of the fact that many today carry with them hybrid identities, right? That we're not just one thing. We don't identify with being this way or that. And in essence, even if we're not from, or if we're not in tension between different cultures, certainly our notions of identity are constantly shifting, constantly being negotiated as well. Jung, in perceiving East and West in such strict dichotomous ways, may be perpetuating popular stereotypes. He uses phrases like the mysterious Orient and the baffling mind of the East. And this in turn reinforces prejudices and perhaps Jung is guilty of what Saeed describes as Orientalism. Jung's interpretation constitutes yet another narrative that promotes the colonizer's model of the world. But also note the inherent dualism in Jung's thinking. By setting up West and East, us versus other, he's creating a binary that contradicts the essence and the implications of his notion of the collective unconscious, i.e. fundamentally, we are all interconnected and the same. Jung is also working with corrupted sources. He's not using the strongest translations, and the secondary sources he uses were clearly biased and reflect their own time. By not being critical about these, he inherits these limitations, i.e. They, they become central and core to his own psychological tenets. We are left to ask, was Jung truly engaging in a dialogue with the East, or was it a one-sided conversation? J.J. Clark is adamant that Jung was aiming to build a bridge of understanding with Eastern thought, and really contributed to the growing appreciation of the East in the West. In raising the profile of the East and the West, Jung was fighting against rationalism and scientific positivism, perspectives that may remain closed to a multiplicity of perspectives. And essentially, what you, you can't deny is that Jung is providing a multiplicity. He's basically saying that there are multiple God images, not just one, and they're all equally valid. He's thus destabilizing the belief that the West is best and that there is only the rest. All God images are equally valid and express our experience of the divine. But it is undeniable that his psychology remains his reference point, constituting the foundation from which he is engaging the East. This leads to a misinterpretation of Eastern texts, beliefs, and practices. Clark rightly points out that Jung fails to grasp Eastern metaphysics on its own terms. For example, in yoga, what is sought is the possibility of a higher state of consciousness, in which awareness is not obliterated, but transformed into a condition where the concerns and limitations of the individual ego cease to be of central concern or importance. Um, another example, any karate practitioners here? Any karateka? Okay, fantastic. You know about kata, right? Do you know san shin? Yeah, okay. So basically, the essence of san shin is the merging, if you will, of mind, body, and spirit. San Shin literally translates as the three battles, right? But when you're performing the kata, and especially at the higher levels, you're completely embodied. You're marrying the breath with the movement itself. And at the higher levels, you're integrating that spiritual aspect. So I think it's definitely wrong for Jung to kind of go in and say that the East is only really leading to a disembodied experience and um, engagement with the unconscious. Jung thus misunderstands the nature of things like yoga and meditation and fails to appreciate that there are many forms of yoga, not just one. He is ultimately basing his criticism on a Western account of one form of yoga. So he is guilty of a failure to appreciate complexity, and perhaps this is one major reason why Jung's place in the academy is so fragile. In essence, his universalist approach is not in line with the nature of special specialization that defines academia today. Perhaps Jung's complex and at times ambivalent relationship to Eastern thought may be summarized by the following vignette, and with which I will end my talk. While in India in 1938, Jung had the opportunity to meet with Sri Ramana Maharshi, a Hindu sage who mainly believed, or sorry, who many believed to be an enlightened being. Jung decides not to go. So the meeting was set up, right, by actually one of Jung's followers. Everything was you know, good, organized, and then he stays on the boat, right? And his excuse 
is that he had found the key to his psychology, i.e. his study of alchemy. So he actually had some texts shipped to him, right, to India so that he could start engaging with it. So all this work that went into organize this meeting, he just doesn't show up. And J.J. Clark provides an insightful interpretation. In order to maintain his stance of independence, Young felt it necessary to avoid a man who, by repute, may well have been able to penetrate his defenses. For just as he had since his boyhood refused to bend his knee to the Christian way of faith, so with regard to Eastern spirituality, his attitude remained one of guarded objectivity. He could not accept, he could not, quote, accept from others what I could not attain on my own or make any borrowings from the East, but must shape my life out of myself. And that's it.